I used to keep the secrets of the dead. In my 20s, I began working in the obscure field of organ donation. I wore a white lab coat. I carried surgical equipment in a bright orange shoulder bag and an igloo cooler in the same color. I was attached 24-7 to a phone which only rang when someone died. I performed human tissue recovery. My specialty was eyes. I removed eyes and eye tissue from cadavers at all hours in myriad settings that ranged from cl clinical to creepy. I was a living apparition in their quiet realm, haunting morgues, mortuaries, and autopsy rooms. I perform my strange duty in the deep stillness, which is unique to places where the dead reside. There was a macabre formula for these witching hour jaunts, a spooked security guard granting me access to the morgue, keys jangling in his wake, the mechanical hum of human-sized freezers, a dim, harsh exam lamp that cast a cold ring of light, leaving the rest of the room in the lurking gray. The perfume of dead things, formaldehyde, iodine, and decomposition, faint but detectable, like olfactory ghosts. And when the bag was unzipped and the sheet was pulled back, the naked dead, laying as they had been placed, mouths and eyes open to the ceiling, waiting for my work to begin. It was a weird job. It was also creepy as fuck and funny in a way that muggles could not understand. It had to be. The funniest dudes I knew were the autopsy assistants of the medical examiner's office who formed a rap group called The Boneyard during my tenure. We used to go down to Tina's Chicken Shack in National City to watch them play. One of them learned of my love for the film Silence of the Lambs and would pull up his scrubs to rub hand cream into his hairy abdomen when he saw me. It rubs the lotion on its skin, he would say, <laughs> grinning maniacally at me. He gave me this rookie hazing for a few months until one day I started to pull down my pants and show him my Buffalo Bill style undertuck. <laughs> for some reason, he left me alone after that. But that's how it went. We out creeped each other to find the laughter. We messed with each other by laying down in the middle of the office floor hoping to scare an exhausted coworker as they entered the lab late at night. We made up sound effects for causes of death and called living people by their likely diagnoses. When a puffy red-faced man would walk past our window with his lunchtime cigar, one of us would yell out, there goes congestive heart failure. <laughs> it was shitty, it was funny. But the jokes were a defense against the sadness of grieving family members and the weight of the secrets that we kept. Every day, people died. If I could do my job, lives could be healed or saved. Tragic news headlines became forecasts of my workload. Coffee was my new water. I learned to sleep standing up. The adrenaline was constant. Cases balanced on mere minutes. If I couldn't make it to the hospital in El Centro before 2 a.m., the funeral home would take the body and we'd lose the case. Or if I wasn't able to track down a family member in time, someone on the transplant list might be forced to wait or miss a chance altogether. I had opportunities for cushier jobs with normal hours and higher pay and no dead bodies or grieving families to deal with, but those jobs were bullshit. I was hardcore. I thrived where others washed out. I was addicted to the gravity of small moments. Maybe I needed the enormity and intensity of the life and death struggle to feel alive myself. When my phone went off, I received a name, a brief medical history, and a phone number. Then I called the next of kin. It was essentially a cold sales call, but instead of offering them a once in a lifetime chance to purchase a Florida timeshare, I was asking permission to remove the eyes from their dead loved one's head, but I was good at it. In person, I was a college-aged punk who rode my skateboard across the airport parking lot to snatch coolers brimming with body parts. But on the phone, I sounded like a minister in his mid-40s with excellent credit and an Ivy League pedigree. 
the kind of person you could trust with your loved one's corpse. For most families, the decision came down to faith, faith in the character of the person they had lost. For some, it was a desperate wish to change that character with a final act of grace. I will never forget one woman's trembling voice as she gave me her consent to make her estranged father a donor. This will be the only good thing this man ever did, she said. And I heard the words she never spoke. She didn't need to. I knew in that moment that this job was not just about curing blindness. It was here, when consent had been obtained, that profound intimate secrets came to the surface. Each family had to undergo an exhaustive and painfully personal interview about the donor's medical and social history. Sex, drugs, hard time, it was all there. I'm sorry to ask, Mrs. Miller, but was your aunt incarcerated for more than three days in the last five years? No, she was a school teacher. These objections would come fast and furious when the real questions began, and I would diffuse them like this. I know, Mrs. Miller. I'm sorry. Please don't take it personally. I know your aunt was a good person. We just need to do this to assure the safety of the tissue. Or, if you were my friend Nancy, you might not diffuse such concerns so skillfully. <laughs> <clears throat> Sir, did your brother have any history of homosexual behavior? He was a Lutheran minister. I didn't ask how he made a living, sir. <laughs> I asked what he did with his free time. <laughs> Nancy and I worked the late shift together and we leaned on each other through some hard times. Frequently, I would get panicked calls from her while I was in the field and she was at the office. As long as I had worked there, there were strange happenings, noises in the night when the office was empty, objects moving from room to room by themselves, phone calls that, when answered, just hissed softly. I was not easily scared by this, but Nancy was. These fucking ghosts are trifling with me, she screeched into the phone. You better get your ass back here and help me pray them away. I said, Nancy, it's going to be okay. Nothing is going to happen to you. Let one of these motherfucking ghosts do something to me. I will sue this place and own the fucking eye bank. <laughs> it's a nonprofit, Nance. I chided. You can't own it. We do a public service. Then do me a goddamn service and get your ass back here, stat. <laughs> Nancy, you need to call and do those pending next of kin interviews. Ghosts of the dead notwithstanding, the thing Nancy and all of us were most scared of was prying into the private lives of the bereaved and carrying the weight of their grief even if only for 20 minutes, except me. Some families would respond calmly through the worst questions, but something comparatively minor would set them off. Mr. Ackerman, has your wife had sex for money or drugs in the last five years? No, she has not, he responded tersely, and I find the question distasteful. They had been married for more than 50 years. I understand, sir, and I'm very sorry. We're just trying to assure the safety of the tissue for transplantation. She's not tissue, damn you! I heard a choking sob before he slammed the phone down. I called him back, frantic with remorse. No answer. I left apologetic messages over the next several days. No answer at all. We were not able to use his wife's donation for transplant. Not all of the answers were predictable. The daughter of an elderly donor had a soft European accent I couldn't identify. I came to the question about having sex for money or drugs, expecting the standard indignant no. But her mother had lived through World War II France, and after losing her husband in the war, became a prostitute in order to support her family. She had primarily served German troops. Her daughter was so embarrassed about revealing this private family shame to, new, to a near stranger that she wept to me over the phone. I listened, but I didn't hear a shameful secret. I heard the story of a survivor, a fierce mother who did what she had to for her family through tragedies most human beings will never know. I offered this perspective to her, but it felt preachy and awkward. I was a 25-year-old kid trying to offer philosophical comfort to a middle-aged woman who had lived with a private family shame for decades. This was the nature of my job. Working beneath the shadow of death eliminated the differences between us. 
It erased age, sex, race. Death reduces us all to memories and secrets. And maybe the chance to heal another life, maybe several lives. Despite the incredibly harsh working conditions, despite the constant death, despite the emotional burden of carrying the secrets of strangers, this is why I stayed as long as I did. One of the last secrets I shared in those days came from a donor's friend. She insisted that I call her Carol and described herself as Mark's best friend. She had been the closest thing to family that he'd had in life before he died suddenly of a heart attack in his 50s. I took Carol through the first three pages of interview questions and had been surprised by her constant and detailed recall of his long medical history. She had been with him through every bump in the road. They lived next door to each other. They drove each other to doctor's appointments. They bought groceries for each other. They drank coffee together every morning and they watched TV every night, but they never got together. I wanted to know why. When I came to the real secrets, her voice grew quiet, and I pressed the phone against my ear to hear her. Carol, had Mark had any history of homosexual activity in the last five years? No, she said quickly, but as I continued on to the next question, she stopped me. He never said as much, she said, and I, I know he never, never was with anyone, but I always knew deep down Mark was gay. Oh, I said, he never came out to you or anyone else? She paused. He never came out to anyone, ever, she said. He was a wonderful man, but he could not come out. He could not find the words before he, before he died. The quiet between us deepened in the way that it did in those days, in the morgues, in the funeral homes, at moments when the secrets of life and death were revealed. You're saying the words for him, I said. I guess so. He was my friend. He was who he was, and I loved him for it. She came out for her friend because he couldn't do it himself. That being gay in that time was not a big deal or that he had no family didn't matter. It was his secret. He'd carried this secret his whole life like a mortal wound. And though he had never said the words to Carol, she shared Mark's secret over the many years of their friendship. As a last, as a last act of that friendship, she had burned him of that secret to me. I left that job years ago and became a fire chaplain. I ran a nonprofit for firefighters in distress. Now, almost 20 years later, I'm a coach and hypnotherapist. I wandered for years not truly understanding my calling until just a few years ago. I am a keeper of secrets for both the dead and the living. Whether firefighters or veterans or survivors of abuse and trauma, I keep the secrets of the living now. I sit in a room and I listen to people who tell me what they've been through and what it has cost them. We talk about what wakes them up at night, what they dream of, what terrifies them, what inspires them, what they do not reveal to anyone else. It is quietly devastating and it is a sacred honor. All of the air leaves the room and just as before, time slows a silence descends, and we hold hands and share secrets. When I die, I'll take them with me. Thank you.